Hi, I'm Anita Walker, Executive Director of the Mass Cultural Council, and welcome to today's Culture Chat. I am so delighted to have joining us Mandy Greenfield, who is the Artistic Director. Do I have that right? Artistic Director, Executive Director. Artistic Director. God of Williamstown Theater Festival out in the Berkshires, and um, one of our iconic and amazing uh, treasures, which, uh, like so many here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, has had to cancel its season due to the um, coronavirus. Mandy, thank you for being with us today. And as you know, this is a space where, in spite of all the doom and gloom and unfortunate consequences of COVID-19, uh, we like to focus on some of the resilience and innovation. And I'm just going to take your words once again. People who won't take no from the universe <laughs> and find new ways to make sure that the arts and culture stay alive and well uh, for everybody in the Commonwealth of New England. Um, but before we get into what you're doing, that's amazing and innovative and just, uh, well, you'll hear about it in a second. First, talk to me a little about Williamstown Theater Festival and I'm particularly interested, how long have you been there now? I wanna say five years, am I wrong? I have produced five seasons, this is our my sixth. Okay, I was pretty close, pretty close. But when you came to Williamstown Theater Festival, you had a, a fairly um, concrete and specific idea about how you wanted to position this theater festival and how you wanted to serve um, the artists in the field. Talk a little about that. I will, and thank you, Anita, and thank you uh, for asking me to join for this chat, and thank you, everyone, uh, you know, who works uh, with you and around you uh, for the incredible advocacy and um, uh, resource building you do for all of the organizations in the state of Massachusetts. Um, so yeah, I came to the Williamstown Theater Festival uh, as the artistic director and put on a first season in 2015. Um, you know, I kind of came of age um, thinking of the Williamstown Theater Festival, which is now in its 66th year, um, as this kind of storied, mythological, very shiny, very sexy American theatrical institution uh, that also felt uh, very far away. And, and um, you know, for me, while, you know, the work that had come out of it for so many years uh, pushed out and was seen on New York stages and all around the country, and it had this kind of legendary core group uh, that had, had sort of come up with under Nico Sakharopoulos, the founding artistic director. Um, it, it was like a very um, shiny, dazzling place where you knew great work was being made. You knew it was kind of a heartbeat of the American theatrical landscape but it felt like a very closed club. And I didn't think it was for the me's of the world. Um, and so part of what um, I came to Williamstown Theater Festival do was kind of throw open the doors a little bit and say, can this festival continue to be a beacon of excellence, you know, to strive to put on work that is, you know, in line with and in league with the best work being made all over our country and in countries all over the world. Uh, can it be that? Can it be an incubator for new talent as it always had been? Uh, and, uh, you know, really sort of help launch the careers of people as it had through its apprentice and training programs for many, many, many decades before I arrived. But can it also be a place where we set a larger table for the kinds of stories that we're telling and the kinds of storytellers that we're telling them with and in doing that, kind of drive a cultural conversation. Um, and so, you know, my background was largely in new work, which is not to say I don't love revivals, I do. Uh, but I felt like one of the keys to kind of figuring out that last piece, uh, which is how to kind of open up the club and, and really let the Williamstown Theater Festival reflect who we were as a country, reflect who we are as a country, was through bringing living generative artists to the theater festival, particularly in the form of writers, so that the stories we were hanging these ideals on, artistic excellence, incubation of new talent, and driving a cultural conversation, were living, breathing, diverse writers 
from really, really interesting and plural backgrounds uh, so that we could uh, be more reflective of, of sort of who we become as a country. And um, I, you know, we were really lucky that, you know, even as early in my first season uh, and since, I think that the artistic community and kind of embraced that pivot with unbelievable abandon. Um, I think there's such a beloved um, and cherished quality to the Williamstown Theater Festival. Um, I have often, it has often been said to me actually that in some senses, it's a bit of a national theater, right? It's a place where, you know, first of all, it's old, it's endured, it's been through ups and downs. Um, it's seen 66 years um, of art making. And, um, and because I think it is of course contained to the summer, there's something sort of innately joyful and innately, innately um, kind of community based about it. Um, it was actually founded by a group of people who were its originating um, board for purposes actually of sustaining the local economy in Williamstown, Massachusetts in the summers, right? This is a college town when the faculty and the staff and the kids kind of disperse for the summer, it's a different place. Um, so it was founded first and foremost to be a kind of economic stabilizer, but owing to um, what Nico Sakharopoulos uh, did in those first 40 years, and then what you know, successive artistic directors did in the in the years thereafter, it had really become a place I think quite special and um, joyous and community based for a lot of people, both in Williamstown, in New York, nationally and internationally. Um, and so figuring out how to continue that tradition, but by opening up to to more diverse storytelling was really what I was after. And I think it is that special relationship that you have with your audiences in New York and in Massachusetts who come for this, I don't want to say cloistered, but it is a really special time in a very special place um, that you have a trusting relationship. And so uh, you were able to make this pivot um, to new works and new artists that aren't maybe traditionally seen on every single stage. Um, and your audience is stuck with you. You actually do commission plays. We do. Uh, in 2015, my first year, uh, I launched a commissioning program uh, with, you know, incredible commitment from our staff and our board. Um, and uh, we have gone on to grow it such that, you know, we commission anywhere from three to six pieces uh, every year, plays and musicals, uh, some of which have, you know, already made it onto our stage and to New York and beyond our production of, for example, Moscow, 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 Moscow by Hallie Pfeiffer uh, was just uh, thrice Drama Desk nominated a couple of weeks ago. Um, our co-commission of Best Wall's Grand Horizons, which was on Broadway, uh, you know, and closed just shy of the theaters being shut down uh, in New York City, uh, you know, started on our stage and moved in. And, you know, and there are many other projects in the pipeline. Um, and, you know, it's been very fortifying to sort of add this pillar of generative artists to the foundation of a theater festival that has long, long, long been fortified by actors and by directors. Um, and, uh, you know, to add sort of writers into that mix in a way that um, enlarges, I think, the um, impact we can have uh, and the reach that our artists can have uh, has been thrilling. And, you know, listen, writers, uh, we're very lucky that writers, you know, they've loved our commissioning program. And, and part of the love of that and the embrace of that has been, yes, they are commissioned to write a play, but a commission involves writing residency time in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And where better really, you know, to be free to just do the work of a writer than, you know, in one of the most beautiful settings in our country. So uh, in addition to all the work that everyone sees on our stages, most summers, though not this summer, uh, we also have, you know, writers and generative artists working in every nook and cranny um, that we can beg, borrow, or steal our way into in Williamstown. So I wish we could talk about this for the whole rest of our time together, but we have a whole new, speaking of pivot, we're going to pivot to the big pivot that everybody's been having to make this summer. Before we switch topics, however, for those of you who are joining us on this Zoom, um, and if you're less familiar with this little small screen down at the bottom, there's a little box that says Q&A. Uh, just press on that and send us your comments, send us your questions, uh, send us your thoughts about anything that you're hearing today from Mandy uh, and 
and as part of our conversation, we want you to be part of it too. So like so many others in the Berkshires and across Massachusetts and obviously across the country, um, summer critical part of your work. This is the season. This is the 10 weeks where a year's worth of planning and way more than that comes together to create this magic that is theater in the Berkshires. And that door was quite frankly slammed shut for you and everybody else. Um, but this is where I go back to what you told me on the phone, but I decided not to take no from the universe. Uh, how did you manage to do that, Mandy? <laughs> You're very kind to ask it with such generosity of spirit. Um, so yes, you know, as the kind of reality of, um, you know, the universe was making itself clear at every level, at the federal, at the state, at the local, and also at the micro level, um, everyone should be reminded that we are hosted by Williams College. Uh, our, we um, occupy the 62 Center for Theater and Dance in the summer months. We make work on the main stage and on the Nikos. Um, everyone else should, everyone should also be reminded that we are a full-time year-round staff of 12 people who become 400 in the summer. But uh, those 300, you know, I'm a theater person, I should know what 400 minus um, 12 is. Whatever the difference is, all those people have to come from somewhere and be put somewhere to live during their time in Williamstown. So as the reality, uh, you know, became clear at every level that our organization simply by virtue of the law and, you know, the, the ban on public gathering, uh, was in place, could not uh, come together to mount this season. You know, I had a couple of really, you know, dark nights of the soul. And, you know, this is the time of year that we live for. This is what defines us. Um, and I really just had this aha moment based on my own behavior, frankly. Um, you know, in the earliest days of this crisis, like everyone, I was searching for ways to kind of escape, right? Like just anything that would like free you free me from the stress. And I found myself going to podcasts. I found myself able to somehow only listen and also in listening, imagine. And I couldn't do it watching television. I couldn't do it, forgive me, you know, in these formats, right? But I could do it listening. And I just had this moment where I thought, at least what an audio format and theater share is that release into the imaginative process, right? Where the best theater asks an audience to bring something to the watching, to the experience. The best theater doesn't ask, uh, answer all the questions, but it asks all the right questions. And it leaves the audience uh, to have some kind of catharsis or transformation or you know whatever the ancient word is you wanna use that sort of moves you to a different place. And I found myself able to do that, listening to a, a couple of different things in those early days. And I thought, well, we can do this, right? And, you know, sort of coupled with that kind of powerful iconography, you know, that, you know, it, it, we can all conjure of Americans crowded around their radios, you know, during the wars. Um, I just thought like, I've got to figure out a way to do this as an audio endeavor. And, you know, the other thing I'll say is that audio, you know, it's very front-footed, it's very innovative, it's really contemporary, it's really fresh, there's amazing fiction being made, there's amazing stuff happening in this space right now. It's not a replacement for live theater, it can never be, but it can be an absolutely exquisite art form and it can accommodate dialogue. And, uh, you know, I just, I just called Audible and I said, I have an idea and I hope you'll say yes. And um, we worked really quickly and really hard, uh, both between the festival and Audible itself and then with all of the artists to, to come around to this idea and not let this body of work be lost. Um, and not let the kind of creeping apocalypse of cancellations and postponements and doom and gloom um, take us down, you know? And Andy, I'm just gonna interject one thing. For those who don't know, what is Audible? We all know what Williamstown Theater Festival is. Sure. 
Uh, sure. So Audible is the world's largest producer of spoken word entertainment. Uh, they are the um, new media company of Am owned by Amazon that really pioneered to a large degree and popularized books on tape. Uh, so, you know, the Audible catalog, if you, in my opinion, you know, if you want to listen to, and, uh, you know, I'm a reader, so I tend not to listen to books on tape, but when I have, when I'm driving back and forth from New York City to Williamstown, Massachusetts, um, I always uh, download an Audible book on tape because their approach to making the work is dazzlingly artful and um you know they they work with incredible actors their technology is dazzling the the sort of value added to the oral experience makes me feel less bad about listening and not reading if it's in, in a book form because it, it is a different experience um and you know i was also really driven by the frank reality that part of that creeping apocalypse really meant that artists were hamstrung. Their livelihood was being dismantled, you know? And I had this feeling like, I, I not only have to find a way to sal salvage this work and keep this season intact and keep the sort of integrity of this work put together for this season as a whole, I gotta get these artists paid, you know? I've gotta find a way to get them compensated for the fact, you know, the time that, you know, theoretically they'd held uh, to come to the Williamstown Theater Festival. And, um, you know, I imagine many organizations on this call like us, you know, are just, you know, breathless around, you know, what the next, let's call it six to 20, you know, four months are gonna mean for our organizations financially. Um, and, and so that solution wasn't gonna come from us and us alone. Um, and uh, I, I feel very fortunate that we were able to collaborate with Audible in such a way that these artists are being taken care of by Audible. So let's take a little deeper look into what that, what that means and how that happens. So you have a show, it's all ready to mount, it's all ready to be produced uh, for the summer season. You have your actors selected and hired um, and you pick up the phone and say, well, we're actually not gonna do it on the stage. <laughs> we're gonna do this on Audible. What? What's the response? You know, it's funny. When I, the first round of calls, I said, I'm going to say something to you and it is going to cause you both to mourn and to consider. And I'm going to ask you to do it simultaneously and I'm going to ask you to do it fast, right? Because I felt like we had to mobilize quickly in order to um, be able to kind of architect a North Star to reorient toward under the circumstances. And, um, and I think that that was, uh, I think that accurately describes sort of the, the earliest days of me sort of rolling out this idea. There was like depth of mourning, right? Like we're not going to make these plays in Williamstown. We're not going to make them on a stage. We can't have or, you know, gr we can't have audiences come to the theater and there, there's such a mourning around that. Um, but then the consideration of a new possibility and the consideration that what we can do is this other thing, I think really filled um, everyone with a sense of hope, right? I mean, you know, I think one of the challenges of this period is that, and now that we're like in week seven, right? It's hard to remember this is not forever, right? Three, four weeks ago, it literally felt like it was gonna be forever. And now I think like in week seven, people are starting to remember, right? There, we will at some point, right? Like we can see that even with news of, you know, Oxford scientists, be, you know, getting closer to a vaccine, we can see that this is not forever. And oddly, I think that having something to do short term and having something to make, and by the way, while it is not on stage, in many ways, the work that we're doing with Audible is in service of what could be on stage. So for example, we're gonna make an Audible recording of a world premiere musical called Row, which has never been made on stage before. And as a result of the Audible collaboration, Roe will have a full musical development process that no musicals 
ever, ever, ever receive. It will be fully orchestrated. It will be fully recorded as a first draft, right? Of like what this music can be. The, the value of that to the eventual stage production, while Audible is not a stage production, but the value of that process artistically is, you know, unspeakably rich. It's very, very valuable. And, and so I think the short term, yes, we will do this instead of that, was also kind of like a helpful reminder that like, it is only short term. This isn't forever. If we make the musical in this format, we can then take that work and apply it forward when we get back to the possibility of doing it on stage, you know? And, and, um, and each writer, each uh, creative team, and each actor, I think, had some version of that process, right? I am mourning the loss of the production. I'm thinking about how this will occupy me short term and I'm so happy to have something to do and to be compensated to do short term. And then I get to think about how what I'm doing in this space can impact what the ultimate goal is, which is to do it on stage. And connecting those dots, I think, was very um, powerful and very helpful to getting everyone to kind of come along. You know, so you in putting this together, there are steps that you take under any circumstances. You have to rehearse, you have to practice, you have to learn about the characters. And how is all this happening? So um, great question. So um, <laughs> I don't exactly know how, but I will tell you that in the earliest days of the crisis before you know, when we were still modeling these ideas of like, well, maybe we'll not do the first show and maybe we'll consolidate and maybe we'll post, you know, when we were sort of modeling as everyone did, right? The slightest modification through to doomsday, doomsday being the cancellation of the season, right? Um, in, in, those, in those early days, we just stayed in process. We moved our casting operation to Zoom. We moved our play development operation to Zoom. We just did it. And I just said to everyone, you know, if we don't stay in process, the only answer will be we can't do anything because we will not have done our work. We will, you know, so we just have to keep going. And somehow we did it. And it, like the super heroics of our casting team and our staff of just like, we just did it. And that was, you know, such a, um, I think, critical moment for us because it, first of all, showed us we could just keep going, right? And now when we are in a doomsday scenario vis-a-vis -vis the season, it's over. We are so far from doomsday. We, we've just got our musculature in place. We've just, you know, we've continued to cast we have our readings, you know, all lined up. We have script meetings. We have all of the things that we would normally be doing right now in service of a live theater season architected in these formats on Zoom. And we will stay in this format, developing the work and putting the projects together under the auspices of Williamstown Theater Festival, now in collaboration with Audible, but just stay here doing our work. And then when it's safe for 10 to 25 people to gather in a room at the same time, we will kind of hand over to Audible and let them lead, right? And then we'll take all of the work that we've done. Every project will have to be slightly modified, right? Nothing visual can happen in an audio format. So if you have a play where there's a stage direction that says, you know, the door opens and imperceptibly Jim puts his head into the room, right? You can't see any of that. So the, the writers are going to have to, at the point at which we are tailoring for audio, figure out that act of translation. But that will happen in a live room in New York, supported by Audible over a couple of weeks process that just like a, a play will have rehearsals and, tr and uh, you know, sort of dress rehearsal recordings and then re-recordings and a whole process unto itself. Um, so we're sort of harnessing our own process and, and staying in it and the power of that. And then we'll hit pause, we'll do the audio piece, and then we'll figure out what comes next. But you just said something that um, we've had quite a few questions coming our way from someone that I know very well, Charles Baldwin. He actually runs our UP program at Mass Cultural Council. Um, and he focuses his efforts on assuring that there is access to the arts and culture for people who may have barriers to participation through disabilities and so on and so forth. And he says um, he thinks this is very exciting. Um, 
Audible platform, very exciting, but he has a number of questions uh, related to uh, accessibility for people who may not be able to hear. But actually, you just said something that's kind of on the flip side of that, because in a way, no one can see the play. And now we know what a person who is visually impaired experiences in a theater with a stage where they can't see. So now we're all that person and you're actually um, developing a product that is extremely accessible to everyone with their eyes closed. Uh, can you speak a little bit to Audible and how it um, serves people who have difficulty hearing? So I'm thrilled that you brought this up. Uh, first, I will say that, you know, number one, we are an up designated theater and we take that um, designation. It's literally like a badge of honor and a hard won one, by the way. Um, you know, for those of you who uh, were able to see our production of Cost of Living, Martina Mayoke's play, which we did the world premiere of in 2016, which went on to win the Pulitzer Prize in 2018, in service of that play, the Williamstown Theater Festival went through a kind of transformational um, uh, process, both internally and externally, around accessibility. Now, interestingly, I think we had been, in some ways, there already. Uh, we have a long-standing relationship with um, the Kennedy Center through their VSA program. Uh, we have, uh, and because of the commitment of so many of our longest-term staff members, uh, Laura Savia, who heads up our Community Works Project, um, I think we have a real ethos and focus on um, ensuring accessibility and equality, uh, you know, in, in our work at our stages uh, and throughout our culture. Um, in service of cost of living, which of course is a four character play written for two actors with disabilities. Uh, the kind of process of figuring out where we were strong, where we were weak around accessibility um, has really conditioned us to be mindful of this um, all the way through. This is a very long winded and vague answer to your question uh, because the answer to truly, you know, what, how do we make this work accessible is it is in process. It's in process largely driven by the fact that in the season we have cast actors with disability. And so not only does our process need to include, you know, issues around accessibility for the artist's sake, because we have artists with disabilities, we've already just, you know, put it on the table for not only does the internal process need to look at this, but how will the external. So that is on the table and under consideration. I don't have the answer beyond we are committed to figuring it out and um, Audible embraced the question with real ease. I mean, I think that, look, from their point of view, I mean, you know, they know the data that we know, which is that one in every five people in, in on the planet uh, is hearing impaired, right? I mean, you know, even if for no other reason but a business-driven one, it is in their interest to figure out how to get you know, that fifth person on, uh, on, you know, taking in their product. So um, the question has been raised, the commitment to figuring out the answers on the table. And, uh, and as we go through the world of unknowns, uh, hopefully that's one that we can answer very concretely in the near future. You know, everything you have just said really goes to your complete passionate embrace of the power of culture and assuring that um, no coronavirus is going to stand between audiences and the power of the work, um, Ro, uh, this premier musical. Um, it needs to be in the public realm and uh, you have found a strategy to do that and we continue to fine tune. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left and uh, one of the things you said that I thought was really important that I want to call out again is that this is making sure that artists are getting paid, this collaboration with Audible. But what about Williamstown Theater Festival? It's a great question. Um, I will admit that was not a, a driver to this partnership. Um, uh, listen, I think that, you know, the, the partnership with Audible will have tangible and intangible benefits to the Williamstown Theater Festival up to and including that they have made, um, uh, we, we are architecting an arrangement for our most loyal 
both ticket buyers and donors to be able to have special access to this material. Um, and listen, I mean, our brand is about to become global in a way that, you know, if it is, we're not aware of. <laughs> so, so like, you, there are definitely wonderful things uh, that will come of this partnership that will, you know, enlarge us and, and that all of that is great. Um, but the reality is that, you know, this is not a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow for the Williamstown Theater Festival. It wasn't conceived that way. It, it isn't executed that way. We, like every not-for-profit that A, is in the live entertainment space, that is in the public gathering space, and that is, frankly, um, too reliant on revenue, right? That um, owing to just the evolution, of, frankly, of funding for the arts at the federal level in this country, you know, we are far too reliant on revenue, and we are looking at a zero revenue year, right? We, we are... Um, nearly 50% reliant on revenue, revenue in the form of ticket sales and also royalties and other, you know, income streams that are not philanthropic. And um, that won't be realized this year. And it's going to be brutal. I think the crawl out is going to be brutal. I'm not without hope. I think like, you know, we, we are out there already with an incredibly devoted board of trustees, um, an incredibly lo loyal donor base, um, an incredibly innovative staff. We will find our way. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, I was, I was in the professional arena in 2008. We know that the tail on these um, certainly economically devastating moments is later, right? Longer and later. Um, and, and I think it's going to be a rebuild. And I think we're going to need to be, um, you know, as innovative long-term on that side of things as we, you know, we have tried to be short-term in, in just kind of responding to the virus. Um, but it's going to be a tough road out, I think. Mandy, I told you this once before, but I want to say it again. I'm in such imagination, I'm such admiration of your your imagination, your creativity, persistence, and quite frankly, your courage. Um, it 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 takes a lot of courage to do something brand new, uh, but in defiance of the universe. And um, I know that you'll be one of our leaders who will lead our field out of this uh, the dark days. Um, and you're already doing so. So thank you. Thank you so much for what you're doing for theater, for Massachusetts, uh, for everyone who loves uh, the wonderful work of the artists that you work with. And thank you for joining us today on our Culture Chat. Thank you, Anita. Thank you for all you do.